Hi, David here. Thanks for watching. Um, the most popular blog post I've put up in the last several months uh, is about something that really happened <laughs> to me and my wife on Palm Sunday, no less. It was called Snake. Yeah, <laughs> that probably gives you an idea. Huh? Well, um, I'm going to read that for you in case you didn't get a chance to read it. And you can find my blog at www.davidandersontheauthor.com in case you're interested. So um, let me pull it up here. And here we go. I woke up on Palm Sunday. We weren't going to church because of the coronavirus restrictions, but it was Palm Sunday. My wife and I decided to take advantage of the fact that many services are available online now, especially in response to coronavirus. Particularly, my sister, a Presbyterian minister, had started filming her services at home to broadcast on Facebook and YouTube. My wife gathered some palm leaves, tied a ribbon around them, and taped them to our door. And if I could show my screen to you now, um, you'd see the picture of it. Um, just, you'll have to use your imagination for some of these. She made blueberry pancakes and I made scrambled eggs. We were looking forward to a pleasant breakfast and my sister leading worship right in our home. While I was getting my plate together, my wife called out from the dining room. It almost sounded like the way she screamed when she saw a mouse, but there was something different about it. I figured it must be a critter of some kind. She rushed back to the kitchen. I asked what it was, but she couldn't even tell me. I went to see, and there in the middle of our dining room floor was a snake. Not a big one. Um, it was only a little more than a foot long, maybe a foot and a half. A uh, little bit bigger around than a pencil. But still, a snake. In our home. This cannot stand. Perhaps the truest verse in the Bible is when God told the serpent there would always be enmity between women and snakes. Genesis 3, verse 15. She hates snakes, and I wasn't thrilled about it either. It started crawling for the china cabinet. I stepped on it before it got there. The front half was under the cabinet, so I figured that would block it from making a quick strike on my foot but I was only wearing sandals. Maybe its head would come back out. So I lifted my foot and it went under the china cabinet. Great. Now how are we gonna get it out? Needless to say, Palm Sunday and worship were forgotten at that point. Why didn't I just keep my foot on the snake? I had stopped it from going under the china cabinet. And the Bible says, you will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent, you will trample underfoot. Psalm 91, verse 12. I had it under my foot, just like the Bible says. Should I grab it at the bottom half and pull it out? I shouldn't have been afraid to do it. After all, the Bible says, and these signs will accompany those who believe. They will pick up snakes in their hands, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. Mark chapter 16, verses 17 to 18. So I could just grab that snake and not worry about whether it was poisonous and then take it deep into the woods outside my home and release it. That's supposed to be one of the signs of a believer. While I had it under my foot, why didn't I grab it? 
for the same reason I don't drink cyanide, strychnine, or diesel fuel, even though this verse says it won't hurt me. Folks, hear me when I say this. Not everything in the Bible is supposed to be taken literally. So no, I'm not going to grab that snake with my bare hands because a couple of Bible verses taken out of context say I can. The point of Psalm 91 is not for you to go to the local zoo, climb into the lion's cage, and jump on its back and say, Look, I can trample a lion underfoot because I believe in Jesus Christ. Many Christians in the first century found out that was not meant literally, in case you've forgotten. So we were trying to figure out how to get him out from under there and how to tra trap him once he did. While I kept an eye on the snake to be sure he didn't leave and crawl under something else, my wife brought a HelloFresh box, a rake, a paint roller, a broom and dustpan, a yardstick, and a pillowcase for various ideas we had. <laughs> I, tr I tried calling local pest removal services, but they were closed. Whether because of coronavirus or that it was Sunday, I don't know. Finally, I went to the best how-to source on the web, YouTube, and found a video from a Tampa area pest control expert. Glue traps. That was his advice. My wife went to the store to get some. And again, if I could show you my screen, you'd see a picture. Uh, the label says works on rats, mice, insects, and snakes. Small ones, at least. Meanwhile, I might wondered if we might need to move the china cabinet to force him out, so I removed everything from the top section. We never moved it. Instead, we put some glue traps under it. But how do we force the snake onto the trap? My wife fashioned a coat hanger and prodded it into the corner where I had set a trap. Then its tail showed out the back. I folded another glue, true glue trap over its tail to make sure I had it. It was hard to pull out because the front half was indeed stuck to a glue trap. And if I could show you my screen, you'd see a picture of the snake right now. I thought about killing it, but the guy in the video reminded me a lot of snakes kill and eat other pests like mice and rats. It didn't look like any of the poisonous varieties of snakes in this area, so I was okay with letting it go. He said you could free it from the trap with vegetable oil. I tried the tail first, after going outside, of course. The snake worked its tail free, so one trap down. I took it deep into the woods and poured oil over it. Within a few minutes, he worked himself free and crawled away. Later, I found out it was a rat snake, so I'm glad I let him go. Lessons for a Coronavirus I had never had to remove a snake from my house before. I didn't know what to do. So how did I do it? By quoting Bible verses or naming and claiming promises from the Bible? Truth is, I did quote this verse in my mind. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Psalm 91 verse 12. But you already said not to take that verse literally. So what good was that supposed to do? I said don't take it literally. I didn't say don't meditate on it. I meditated on that verse the whole time I was trying to figure out what to do, the whole time I pulled the snake out and took it outside, and while I was pouring oil over it to release it. I wasn't treating it as a promise that God was somehow obligated to put a force field around me and my wife so the snake couldn't touch us. Come on, honey. 
We can just wait for it to come back out and I'll grab it then. Here's two verses that say snakes can't hurt us because we're believers. Don't you believe the Bible? How do you think that would have gone over? Remember what I said earlier about enmity between women and snakes? I still put on whatever protective equipment I could. Socks, shoes, long pants, and gloves. I didn't expect that quoting that verse meant the snake couldn't bite me. I meditated on it for one reason only. To keep myself calm through the process. I listened to an expert. I did what the expert said, and it worked. I didn't use the scripture as a substitute for expert advice, only as something to meditate on so I could stay calm. The author of this psalm did not mean for it to be taken literally. It would help us all to remember psalms were originally sung. Songs and poetry, most of the time, are not meant to be taken literally. They are meant to move us emotionally. Emotions were running high with a snake in our house. This song was made for moments like this. It was meant to help you stay calm and trust God when you have to do something that scares you. And I can tell you, in that way, it worked for me. So with coronavirus, just as with snakes, listen to the experts and follow their advice. What time I'm afraid, I will trust in me. Psalm 91 is one of the most popular scriptures for promoting peace of mind in stormy circumstances, and with good reason. It is not a license to abandon common sense. As I heard a preacher today talking about his reasons for closing the church and moving services online, faith works best when it's combined with common sense. So with the understanding that this is not a promise that obligates God to protect you from coronavirus by becoming your invisible hazmat suit, I invite you to meditate on these scriptures from Psalm 91 that I am meditating on for comfort and peace in the storm. Verses 1 to 2. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. Verses 3 to 4. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. Verses 5 to 6. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. Verse 7. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Verses 9 to 10. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. Verses 15 to 16. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them with long life. I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. Again, I'm not saying these are promises that obligate God to protect you. 
but did listening to that make you feel more at peace? Try meditating on you know, a couple of verses at a time from Psalm 91 and see what that does for you. Grace and peace to you.